Hello and welcome to this week's devlog for my procedurally generated voxel based RPG game. This is a game where I attempt to distill a large and expansive procedurally generated world into something that fits well onto a mobile device. Last week I spent the entire time rewriting my collision system in order to get around some of the technical roadblocks I was facing. This was a pretty gruesome job in many ways, mostly because I had to jam some of the code that already existed into this new system, which was pretty time consuming. But this technical rethink is about the only thing left to do in order for me to get back to working on the actual gameplay stuff, and that's sort of what I want to do. But besides, I mean, this was gonna be a long time coming anyway, because I'd spent a lot of time writing rubbish code in order to try to figure out the gameplay loop. So really the problem was that I had to separate many bits of the world component off into different sections that would allow me to sort of stack and have multiple worlds that exist at once. This would allow the player to be able to traverse the world and visit things like dungeons, villages, places, that sort of thing. So basically, sit back, don't get too comfortable because it's gonna be another technical one this week. Now, I am using an entity component system for this game, like a true champion. Basically, the idea is this. Oh, did you miss it? Basically, entities are created via composition rather than inheritance, which is different from how you go about doing things in the standard object-oriented approach. Did that actually make any sense at all to you? Well, if not, then have a look at this example. In the world right now, these trees are actually just entities. All they have is a mesh component. These houses and villages are also entities. They have a mesh component as well as a billboard component when the player gets close enough for it to be visible. Finally, the player and the goblins are also entities, but they just have way more components that allow them to function. And long and short, the real benefit of this system is it's extremely flexible. So say I wanted to alter the trees in a way that I could make it so the player can destroy them with an attack. All I really need to do is give them a health as well as a collision object. And as a result, you can destroy the trees with an attack. Now that that's explained, the thing is that my engine already had an entity component system. It just wasn't really fit for purpose for this game. I needed to have multiple of these systems active at a single time, and unfortunately the engine was just wasn't designed in a way that it would allow it to be able to do that. So instead of finding a solution, I just cried for a week. But then, while crying, I found a solution to the problem anyway. Basically, my engine embeds a scripting language, which is what this game is written in anyway. So I essentially just decided I would try and write the bare bones entity component system from scratch in this language in a week and try and switch over to it. If it did, then in theory, this would solve all of my issues relating to the world lifetime and would hopefully still work quite well. So here's how I did it. With an entity component system, an entity is really nothing more than just a handle into a sort of database of its components. I'm basing part of the implementation on this library, which is called Entity X, which I've used previously. So the way that the entity handles work in this system is that you essentially split the handle into two distinct parts. So you have the version part and the index part. You would then maintain two lists for your entities. One is a list of versions and the other is the actual entries of the entities. The whole point of the version handle system is you use it to check if your handle is still actually valid. So for instance, when you go to create an entity, the lists get updated. If you were then to destroy one of those entities that you created, the version in the list would get bumped. So what this means is that if anywhere else in the code you still hold a reference to that entity, you can just check if it's valid extremely easily. So with that system, I now had my 64-bit entity handles in place. The next step was to implement the components. I define my component type in this enum, and then I essentially go off and populate an array with a bunch of these component pool objects. The whole point of this system is just to wrap around the free list as an efficiency measure. Basically, whenever I create a component, it just checks the free list, and if it's empty, it just pushes the component to the end of the pool. Then, when you go to delete a component, it doesn't necessarily have to remove from the list. Instead, it just pushes the entry to the free list to mark it as available. Then, when you go to create another component, it can just populate by taking a value from the free list and populating like that. That is a pretty common software optimization, as it just means I don't have to search the list each time I want to add something. And I also do a similar thing for when I create enemies, so it all kind of borrows from each other. From there, each entity has to actually know what components it has. I've designed the system in a way where you can't actually have duplicates. Instead, I allow you to have 64 different types of components, and they're all packed into this hash. So, using this hash system to determine whether each component is populated or not, I can just determine whether the bit is on or off to whether the component is available. Now the thing was actually tracking the individual components in the list to each entity was a bit more complicated. So I took a bit of a shortcut and made it so that when an entity wants to actually check its components, it does a linear search 
across the component pool to find its entity ID. Um, this might not be the most optimum approach. It really depends how you actually use the entity component system. I mean, there will be trade-offs. It's kind of memory versus CPU, that type of thing. Um, the thing is that I haven't figured out how I'm actually going to use this system and where the bottleneck is going to be. So as a result of that, I just kind of thought I'll do that good old tactic of make it work, then make it fast. And once I figure that out, eh, should be straightforward. The thing is that I'll be profiling this system anyway at a later date. So hopefully by that point, I'll be able to tell where a lot of the bottlenecks actually are. So that was the entity component system. It's fairly bare bones and I wrote it in two days. I also wrote a bunch of unit tests to check it actually worked as I expected. Unfortunately, there are some duplicates like this one as Squirrel doesn't actually let you inline code like some languages do, at least efficiently. But either way, it fits the need that it was made for. So for the rest of this week, I dedicated my time to converting the entities from the old system to the new system. This did take a lot of time as the whole thing was extremely coupled together and was generally just a massive rat's nest. But this is why you do the technical work before the content. I began by getting the EXP orbs converted over as they were one of the simpler entity types. However, I ended up having to deal with a bunch of stupid regressions like this one where the orbs weren't actually collected properly. It took me a long time to figure out the problem. Basically, the entity system in the engine before had this move towards function, which was just a helper function. I had ultimately had to scrap that and just switch to my vector three move towards function. The problem with that was that it was implemented completely differently, which meant that the orbs didn't behave as expected. But then when I came to actually switch the code over, the system basically just worked worse than it did before. So then from this code, can you tell what the problem is? I didn't dereference these stupid pointers. So the code did some pointer arithmetic and then passed that value off to the new vector. And then the vector was just like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I'll just read that directly. Meaning the values that it ended up with were just completely broken. After fixing that, the code worked as it did before with my new system. But I think that just goes to show how easy it actually is to shoot yourself in the foot when you're using C++. With the orbs now converted over, I just went through all the entities and converted them one by one. I had to make a bunch of changes to the code that already existed just to accommodate the fact that I now had basically two entity systems in place, but I was gradually getting there. And to be perfectly honest, it's not completely done yet. There was some conversion work that was left over at the end of this week, but it'll be done at the start of next week. And like, you know, whatever, it's gradually getting there. This is quite an exciting time for the project though, as this is one of the final hurdles that was left over in this actual technical work. So I should finally be able to get back to a, some interesting gameplay work in the future. We've got 17 weeks left in the year, the same number as my mental age. And I guess we'll just have to see how much of the gameplay I can get out by this point. So see ya.